Well, hello everyone. Once again, I am not in class, but I'm traveling worldwide. I'm attending a conference. Right now, I'm actually in Helsinki. Guess where? Finland. And I'm attending a conference. Well, not quite. I'm still in Tucson while we're filming. So uh, it's okay mm -hmm. to do some changes and play with multimedia. That's what the whole course is really all about. We want to, James and I want to uh, introduce the text for today. These are the Troubadour poetry. We thought it might be a good way to start out with giving you some visuals. And James has here a facsimile. Tell me, James, what do you have? Well, I just thought it was interesting since we've been talking about uh, music as well as literature in the Middle Ages. And here we have uh, some illuminated pages of uh, songs with uh, musical notes attached to them as well. And uh, we can see the notes. And they look somewhat similar to uh, what musical notes look like today, but obviously a little bit different as well. Did it strike you maybe that uh, the combination of images, text, and notation form almost what we call in German a Gesamtkunstwerk, a sort holistic? Of the Wagnerian yes, ideal. Yes, almost. Yeah. Quite uh, charming how the musicians and the artists, the scribes, all of them collaborating. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so what we really do is we look at medieval manuscripts, study medieval art, and that is a uh, an expression of the entire artistic world and the world of the aristocracy. I have another wonderful example, and maybe you just can decide on another image. Um, James showed you just a facsimile of a manuscript, so it's a page in a book. And in many cases, medieval art also was expressed in sculptures. And so I have here a fabulous book that gives us ideas of wooden sculptures used in altars. Now this is late medieval, but um, it gives you just an idea of what late Gothic, late 15th, early 14th century, uh, excuse me, late, uh, early 15th century art mm -hmm. looks like. And I also have to say something, but I think it's worth for, for students just to get an idea of what they can see when we go to medieval churches, Gothic churches, and have then this incredible experience of uh, these wooden sculptures. This now happens to be in Rotenburg, up der Tauber, one of the most beautiful medieval towns. A little plug-in, I'm going to Rotenburg <laughs> next year with my students. So once again, those of you who are maybe considering joining me in my medieval tour, um, well, it's kind of a sales pitch, you know, but, <laughs> but uh, at the same time, I just want to show you all why I am so excited about this art, why I always love to go back, and why I love teaching this. There is everywhere, there is this art, there is the beauty, there is the craftsmanship, so the absolute brilliance of that time, of course, it's a different world, but we are really impressed. There is something magical about it. So maybe we can close mm -hmm. this book. And I would like to share with you a third example. And this example is called an hour book. I'm showing you something that is called an hour book. In late medieval times, people started to practice their religious devotion in private, particularly noble ladies. And they were very interested in having devotional books, prayer books or books about all kinds of artistic expressions. And there are these tiny little sort of almost paperbacks, we would call them today, if they were not wonderfully vellum bound volumes. This is now happens to be a book about hunting. And I'm turning the page just to give you an idea of the really incredible beauty, the artistic beauty of these uh, books. Uh, showing us scenes of hunting. But let me move just a little bit to the side so that you just have an idea how calligraphic these texts were. Remember, this is not printed. This is written by hand on parchment. OK, so we gave you a couple of examples, visual examples, medieval art. And hopefully, you have right away an understanding that 
whenever we look at texts or listen to music, we have always to combine that with images, uh, the craftsmanship, religion, and the social structure of that time. And so, courtly love, that's what we really will talk about or are discussing throughout the course, is situated in the wider social context. Mm -hmm. And for that purpose, today we look at the very famous troubadours. And we will look primarily in this video on, into the poetry by the first one. Basically, the founder of Cordy Love poetry, a man called Guillaume Le Neuf, William the Ninth. Did something strike you, James, as to um, about the background or something that you found interesting maybe? Well, I thought it was interesting contrasting his uh, the short biography provided here at the beginning with uh, some of his works. Um, it's mentioned in the, the bi biographical section that he was fighting for a lot of his reign and uh, was constantly uh, struggling with various things and uh, you can sort of see that uh, reflected in this text. He's got a very down-to-earth style. Yes, very, sometimes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then sometimes it's very elusive, very esoteric, mm -hmm. even sometimes very religious. Mm -hmm. Did you also notice that sometimes it's very ludic? Yes, it's very vulgar at some times, yes. we could say. Uh, are you familiar with the word ludic? I have used that, um, I think, um, a week ago. Mm -hmm. And ludic is an adjective which means playful. Mm -hmm. It comes from the Latin ludus. So I think sometimes it's just all ludic. It's playful, it's, it's joyful. And I actually see a number of parallels to the Carmina Burana. Mm -hmm. These were clerics, and yet they composed all kinds of <clears throat> dirty poetry, yeah. right? Uh, playful poetry. Um, I think these were very brilliant, highly educated people. Mm -hmm. And so our modern sensitivities as to what is norm, standard, ethics, morality, might not quite apply to some of those things, particularly if it's ludic, mm -hmm. if it's playful, trying to demonstrate a certain level of culture and civilization. And another thing that struck me was the fact that we're moving out of the, uh, the clerical realm and into the aristocratic realm, whereas before we had most of the art and everything produced yes. by uh, the clergy or clergy-related um, artists, but now we've got... Right, but of course keep in mind we have discussed uh, uh, Hartmann von Auer's uh, Poor Henry or Lord Henry. We already had a different text uh, reflecting noble culture, secular world, um, but there, it was a different genre. Mm -hmm. Hartmann von Auer, that, uh, he writes narratives. And I always like to, for your own sake, I like to switch from narratives or prose more or less to uh, poetry. So. Now we're moving from, not quite prose. Let me make this really clear, right? In the Middle Ages, we hardly have prose. It's all, at least in the literary world, everything is in verse. Even if the poets tell us stories, it's in verse because it has to be performed by music. For that reason, mm -hmm. you showed us the uh, manuscript with the notations. But these are now poems. And these mm -hmm. are very specifically intended to convey ideas, but not necessarily to tell a complete story, mm -hmm. but rather this is musical. So these are little, um, how shall we say, kaleidoscopic uh, impressions mm -hmm. that don't really tell us a long story, with one exception. There's one poem where this knight does not speak or pretend ah, yes. to... Okay, what we'll comes to that? To be mute, yeah. If it tends to be mute, there's mm -hmm. a kind of a story. <laughs> Let me, however, first give you a little bit exciting and uh, curious background. Um, we just don't know so many things. We just don't know where this poetry suddenly came from. It is really fully developed in the vocabulary, imagery, in style, notation, music, everything. It is almost perfect already. It is not primitive, simplistic poetry. And yet we don't quite know the inferences, where that might have come from. Interestingly enough, Guillaume lived in southern France. We call that area today the Provence. And we know that he was quite a bit involved in wars against the Arabs. At that time, Arabs, to a large extent, still controlled 
uh, the Iberian Peninsula. Mm -hmm. So you have Muslim, Arabic cultures, and we know that Arabic culture, much earlier before European culture, had developed these, these kind of ideas of courtly love, of erotic poetry. Mm -hmm. So also, we are in the midst of the Crusades. So the first crusade took place in, or started in 1096. That's a good hundred years before Guillaume writes his poetry. And I don't want to go much into the Crusades. You know a little bit about the Crusades. Mm -hmm. Well, right? I found it interesting throughout the whole uh, section. You know, the, the biographies show that most of them had something to do with the Crusades, and a lot of the poems speak about, peripherally, about yes. the Crusades. But it's in a contradiction, because isn't it odd? And let's say during the day, they slaughter people. They cut off limbs and heads and blood and guts everywhere. At night, they sit in front of the fire and sing these beautiful poems. An odd contradiction. Mm -hmm. These crude knights who barely survive in the heat of the Mediterranean, starving almost and fighting for their lives. And at night, suddenly, this beautiful love poetry. And particularly once they had come back, obviously they were somehow influenced by Arabic poetry. We cannot quite prove it, but it's a very intriguing concept to how culture is transferred from one to the other. We're not quite sure how this might have worked language-wise, because these crusaders didn't know Arabic, for sure not. But they lived sometimes for years, sometimes for decades in the Holy Land, and certainly they picked up a lot of things, or heard the songs performed by Arabic composers. Or take one more uh, component. Guillaume lived in southern France, whether he heard songs in the Holy Land, or whether he heard those songs from jongleurs, that's the word, jongleurs, who had traveled through the Iberian Peninsula and then arrived at his court and presented woof, Arabic stuff. Well, it's right next door. You just have to cross the Pyrenees. That's exactly right. Mm. And we know that he actually ventured into the Iberian area and fought, and so there were lots of contacts. Um, another possibility is uh, that um, these courtly poets at that time might have been influenced very strongly by the new adoration of the Virgin Mary. So we see that also in art. I don't have a good example right now, but maybe on Thursday mm -hmm. I will be able to show a couple of images. But the new adoration, idealization, you could almost say uh, glorification of the Virgin Mary. That becomes a very strong cult in the religious sphere, in the church. But it seems also to have carried over, influenced, the secular world. So it's a very interesting situation. We have a very early a troubadour poet, and we should also talk about the word. I mean, what does that mean, troubadour? Do you have any idea? Mm. So troubadour, it's an, it's an Provençal word. So they didn't speak really French. They spoke uh, Occitan. Occitan, double C, is the language to some extent still spoken in southern France. Interesting, if you travel, for example, today to northeastern Spain, let's say Barcelona, or you are somewhere Girona, or Zaragoza, or any of those places, then you will notice these people speak not Spanish, they mm -hmm. speak Catalan, mm -hmm. right? And Catalan is just a variant language and much more closely related to Occitan than to Spanish, actually. So you have a variety of different groups in that whole region, and I think the more cultural contacts you have, the more culture flourishes. You know, borderland issues. I mean, mm -hmm. Just to digress, look at Tucson. You know, yeah. Tucson is a border uh, city. And how many cultures do we have here? Mexican, Anglo, Finnish, Swedish, Greek, uh, Russian, you name it, right? Well, we see the, uh, the Mexican influence in Tucson just like we would see the, uh, the Muslim influence in Spain. That's right. And all the mariachi music that we love, all the great food they mm -hmm. serve. Uh, this is just part of our culture. We like this mix, the rainbow. And I think the Guillaume and uh, poetry, Guillaume's poetry and the Troubadour poetry is just an expression of that too. And in this regard, I think medieval culture is an incredibly interesting 
model for our own culture because we observe how much these various cultures influence each other. We observe later how, for example, the French poets influence the Germans. And we turn to the German love poetry, strongly influenced by the troubadour and Trouvert poetry. We know that later the English poets were influenced by the French, the Spaniards were influenced, the Italians learned to some extent from the Arabs south and from the Germans to the north. Mm -hmm. And they in turn gave to the rest of Europe. So it is really an incredible hodgepodge and a give and take. And so for that reason our study of troubadour poetry um, is a good sample, uh, really interesting I think uh, intellectual uh, enterprise. So, Troubadour, troba, that's a Catalan word coming back. Now, troba means to find. Finding, first of all, a melody and then finding a theme, so something you want to talk about. I thought we maybe start with um, one or two poems and uh, maybe a very standard one. I would like to begin with a very specific one, a poem you all should be familiar now with. Remember, Kamina Buranam. That's a week ago, and I introduced the various types of songs, genres. So we talked about the pastorella uh, the week ago, mm -hmm. and I explained how the setup uh, allows us to categorize this poem. We also had a poem about the coming of spring, and I had used also the word locus amenus, a beautiful mm -hmm. nature setting. And if we take a look on page 117, poem number 6. So, please, would you all, although I'm not here, please open your book. We need to work together, all right? That's the whole point. Whether I'm standing on the stage or I'm talking to you via video, I hope that doesn't make a huge difference. And, of course, James and Lee and Tina will later jump in and also will talk more in person about the, some of these poems. I think poem number uh, six is quite interesting. Now, when we see the meadows once again in flower and the orchards turning green, streams and fountains running clear, the breezes and the winds, it is right that each man celebrate the joy that makes him rejoice. Now, what is your impression? Would you like to be in that setting? Oh, for sure. I thinking of <laughs> Sabino Canyon somewhere. Mm -hmm. Let's say April, mm -hmm. water still running, it's fresh, it's wonderful, lovely, mm -hmm. some music, a party going on. So. <laughs> or maybe even Provence. Provence with the <laughs> lavender and thyme <laughs> everywhere, good wine. Oops, no, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> so, but very clear, right? The, you get the sense this is a stanza that beautifully illustrates the beginning of spring. So, a nature poem. Um, the poet sets us all up. He situates us right away there where everyone would like to be, right? It's a beautiful setting and nature and human culture come together in everything in terms of love. We all know this, you know, what is love? Well, the bees and the butterflies mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It comes in here just as well. These are archetypal images. Remember, we had talked about it uh, two or three weeks ago, mm -hmm. archetypal. This is how the experiences all people enjoy. Love is, well, love is in the air, right? You can just yeah. start singing yeah. this. It's always, <laughs> I bet I don't start singing. You all run <laughs> screeching out of the room. So. Um, but he begins then to explore um, about what the meaning of love is. Uh, and also his pain. Uh, why do I get not one bit of it? So he observes that. He sees that everywhere around him there is love. And he expresses his disappointment, his sadness. And how disappointed he is. I, third stanza. I never had the joy of what I loved and I never will as I never did. For I am aware I do many things, and my heart says it is all nothing. It is the melancholy. It is suddenly sort of, as we would say in German, Weltschmerz. Mm -hmm. uh, you might want to explain later a little bit more Weltschmerz. You are familiar <laughs> with that yeah. word, right? So uh, the global sense of sorrow. Mm -hmm. Oh, poor me. Oh, everyone is in love. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's quite uh, entertaining, of course. Remember, this is entertainment. This mm. is poetry that is performed in the evening uh, when the court assembles. They might have done their tournament and they have nothing to do. There is no DVD. They cannot get to online. Uh, cannot fax, phone, nothing. So they just have to talk to each other. And I think that might also be why they combine so many of the arts together. Exactly. So the artists come together and they, uh, they are being paid by these nobles to create all this wonderful entertainment. And so what else is more interesting and exciting than love? Particularly when they say, oh, I'm not in love. Oh, I'm alone. And so that's what he says, right? <laughs> So, and so I know less than anyone what pleasure is. The pleasure principle. Sigmund Freud would have a heyday. He, mm -hmm. he could analyze this really very well and would come up with all kinds of wild analyses. Oh my goodness. So, but simply, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And I think it's important that, you know, we, we see that word right off the, the bat here with these songs because we're not necessarily talking about the love that uh, exists between man and God, but we're talking about a physical love. That's right. But it could also be translated very easily. He doesn't say what kind of love. Mm -hmm. He's just talking about emotions. And he's talking about uh, possibly even between him and the Virgin Mary. I mean, if you want, you could simply interpret it in that way, mm -hmm. don't you? Uh, I mean, of course, in this context, it is for a secular audience. But in the back of their mind, it all is evoking that imagery. It could also be, my goodness, the Virgin Mary is not really in, in favor of me. But in this context, very concretely, it is erotic love. So we do have here a public discourse. That's, for me, very, very important that this poetry that indicates, reveals how much in public everyone talked about love. I mean, we at parties today, uh, when the politicians get together. They don't talk about love. Oh, no, no, no. That's a private matter, mm -hmm. right? But in the Middle Ages, uh, particularly among the nobles, love, that is the only topic worthy for public discourse. It is the highest art. You're only a true noble if you're a lover. Yeah, so that's really extremely important. So he goes on and um, talks very much about his interest in finding love, to explore the emotions. Um, and then on the next page, the second stanza I find particularly interesting. Let me read it to you. Or would you maybe just read it? Just the second a stanza. Yeah, a man. A man who wants to be a lover must meet many people with obedience and must know how to do the things that fit in court, fit in in court, and must keep in court from speaking like a vulgar man. Very interesting perspective. I think what he says, and this will become the motto almost for all of courtly love uh, poetry we'll ever hear throughout the entire semester, love has something to do with service. Because you want to win a heart. Remember the Kamina Burana, the Gitan? Mm -hmm. There was no service. The man grabbed her by the hand. He forced her to the meadow, right? He exposed her. He raped her, mm -hmm. I think. Horrible. Here, it's a totally different perspective. True love can only exist if there is a sense of service, of pleading, of trying the best you can do. He refers, of course, many people, and you have to obey them. You must know how to speak. I think it's a very important thing. How can you convince a woman or a man, if you're a woman, to love him or her if you don't know how to speak. Mm -hmm. You must be extremely eloquent. You must be able to express your emotions. That is, I think, for guys often very difficult. Yeah. But that's the reason why we practice these or study these poems. They provide us with an example how to learn that vocabulary, right? And and I think it's interesting. I think it's it's a really intriguing contrast between the the previous poems in yes. by Guillaume. Uh, we see that he knows how to master his courtly speech, but we also know that he can speak like a vulgar man at times. That's right. So we have here the conflict, still trying to um, 
to determine how much or what courtly life is really all about. So many scholars have actually argued that the notion of courtly love really served as an educational tool because it is not easy to perform in the service of a king. It's just like for us, it's not easy, let's say, to become a diplomat. It's not easy to move up to a higher social level. Let's say later when, when you all want to become a, a something, a lawyer, a doctor, whatever, you need to know the language. You need to know how to talk, behave, dress. Remember, that's the dress code uh, or the pledge. We have that mm -hmm. even there. This is now professional. This is no longer kindergarten. We are now in the, in the training for real life. Mm -hmm. And this is real life. It shows how all the, those who listen to this poetry will get, therefore, most important material that they can integrate into their own language and their own thinking. And then he shows this is a test. This is a learning experience. We have that in stanza, excuse me, in poem seven, mm -hmm. where he clearly, explicitly is talking about the test but I think you're still right. I think absolutely. Maybe we can turn to that other poem, which is really uh, very entertaining. I would almost call that poem, poem number four. Um, this is on mm -hmm. page 113. Now, can you please all turn to that poem? I shall make a verse since I am sleeping. Okay, page 113. I think here, well, what kind of poem is it? Is it a pure love poem? No, not at all. It uh, it seems it seems like the author wants to have fun with the idea of love. Uh, well, not so much love, but the the sexual act. Sexual I guess. act. Okay. So are we transgressing here? Are we now maybe? Do we saying something bad? Is something talking about sex? Ooh, ooh. The public will not like that. Your parents will not like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> of course, you're all adults, all right, so I don't think we should uh, fool around, don't beat around the bush mm -hmm. and address it. Of course, all love poetry in one way or the other, of course, also talks about the sexual act, but that's not our concern. Our concern is everything around it, namely the culture. Again, Freud would have his feast, yeah. right? <laughs> He would analyze my language and would say, oh my God, this man has this and this and mm. anyway. <laughs> it's kind of interesting, isn't it, how this poetry, it's love poetry. We can have a lot of fun talking about it because the analysis allows us suddenly to look into the uh, mental mindset, right? So I would almost say this is like a ballad. Or actually, in our modern context, we would call it the corrido. This is a genre that is very, very popular here in Tucson. It's, it's a corrido, really. It's someone who composes a song in Spanish about his love affair and a problem, and uh, then he performs it in public. It's the whole genre. The Poetry Center, I mentioned the Poetry Center before, knows this very, very well. It's extremely famous, the corrido here. It's sort of like a chanson? Yes, it's a chanson, a story, an account, mm -hmm. uh, some kind of an adventure story. Shall we go into the details yep. a little bit? And yep. well, you can read for yourself, but let's let's reveal. Let's allow the cat out of the bag. <laughs> in a way, well, this is a pun almost. We have a cat here, mm. in a way. Yeah. <laughs> so true. this man uh, is riding somewhere around. Uh, well, we're in Auvergne, so he just provides us with a geographic reference, and um, he encounters whom? Encounters two ladies, I believe. Oh, were this three? No, oh, three. I'm not quite sure. I think it was three. Let's see. Um, the wives of N. Garin and N. Bernard. Oh, you're right. Uh, that are uh, just two. But that's enough. Two ladies for one man. That's enough. <laughs> we don't need to go much further. So I'm sorry for that. You're right. And um, this guy, of course, the knight. Let's be careful. Guillaume, whenever he says I or me, this is not him. It is a poetic I, all right? Let's always be very, very clear. When we have literature and someone says I and I experience this, this is a poetic I. That means it's the text. I can easily say I traveled to the Mars and mm -hmm. I experienced there's water and I discovered there are aliens. Well, this is literature, right? So 
Okay. So, but he's, he is talking about uh, a member, a male member of his caste. Like, exactly. Mm -hmm. So he really dramatizes this very, very strongly. So um, I think we just can finish uh, our session today. I notice the time is fleeting. Mm -hmm. um, so he wants obviously one thing. What does he want? Anyone knows? <laughs> I think he wants sex. Yeah. Oops, that's yeah. what you said. Yeah. I didn't. <laughs> but it's very clear in this poem what he wants because he, right away he pretends that he cannot speak except babariol, babariol, babarian. Again, remember, this is onomatopoetic, mm -hmm. right? So as if he were mute or his tongue were cut out or something, at least then these two ladies. Well, it's a projection, of course. It's a male projection. Mm -hmm. Women also want something. Very interesting. So he's playing with expectations, uh, desires, dreams. And so these two ladies obviously think, great opportunity. Mm -hmm. Here we have our sex slave. Mm -hmm. And he can't, uh, he can't ever reveal anything about it afterwards. That's right. Mm -hmm. I hope no one heard what I said. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, they both interact, all three interact in an intriguing way. It's a wonderful game, actually. After all, as much as we are laughing about this whole setup, I'm sure the audience at that time laughed about that as well. Oh, I'm sure. Really, really beautiful. So, big enough. We know what they want. They want him. They want his body. They don't care about it. They just want about want him as a sexual object, but they're still very worried. What are they worried about? Well, they're worried about being revealed as adulterous women. Exactly. So this is an extremely important point. After all, we will talk a lot throughout the entire semester, and I will repeat this over and over again and explore this further and further. We are talking about courtly love, which is not necessarily marriage. This depends very much on the genre. So in narratives such as romances, or I remember A Heart of an Hour's uh, Lord Henry, it ends in beautiful marriage. Wonderful, everything is fine. But in love poetry, we have a different world. There, they, they explore emotions, and these emotions outside of marriage. Marriage is arranged, so you cannot really have the, the exuberance of the erotic passion within marriage. It would be just kind of boring. Well, it's not boring, but for the audience, just like today, I mean, you watch TV. Are you ever watching a TV series with a married couple, happily married, they have two or three children? No problems. Any show? No, there are no shows. They're always, right? They're just about adultery or something transgressive. Mm -hmm. And so that happens that's exactly what happens here as well. And it shows, interesting enough, how on the one hand, they are the active ones. They, now they test him. What do they test? Well, they, uh, they think that he might be tricking them, and so they, uh, they get a red cat out, wow. and they have it scratch his back down That's to his right. feet. That's right. And of course, he's getting bloody, mm -hmm. so that hurts a lot. But he's strong enough because his sex drive, yeah. whoops. Yeah. He knows what he's fighting for. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and he demonstrates thereby how strong he is, how self-controlled he is. And then, of course, it gets really crude. And uh, pardon uh, us and, well, actually, we don't need to quote. We don't need to quote. You can read on page 115 yourself uh, after he had proven that he is indeed a fool or... Uh, a mute, they know exactly, they can use him, and what do they use him as? Uh, a sex object. Absolutely, uh, a sex slave, or whatever. And, uh, well, and you can read exactly <laughs> what he's saying, so he ha doesn't hold anything back. He's, I mean, Guillaume, Guillaume clearly says what they did, they enjoyed that, the greatest time uh, for the whole week, and Let's leave it with that, okay? We don't need to go much further. Um, and I think that should be enough, I, except for one thing I would like just to point out, another poem which shows us how wonderful he really is and how poets prove to be really good poems. 
you can all, of course, certainly disagree with that poem. I mean, there might be a lot of people who say, oh, this is really too crude. I don't like that. And I could see their point. So, but he's just playing around. But I think we all can agree that a great poet, singer, artist, architect, whatever, shows his or her skills and abilities by the wide range in his or her repertoire. And for that reason, I would like just very briefly point out poem three on page 112. Yeah, can you quickly turn to poem one, uh, three on page 112? I don't need to discuss it very much, just a few highlights which show you something very, very remarkable and highly unusual. We even don't know until today what to make out of this. I will make a verse of exactly nothing. We don't know what he means. Indeed, he says nothing. He says so much about nothing. It's a nothing poem. Um, actually, we would call it today nonsense poem. And I would just simply like to argue, that's for you to think about it in the future, that to some extent, Medieval love poetry, this is not quite a love poem, I know, but love poets have a lot in common with postmodern poetry, where we also explore the meaning of nothingness, the existential questions. And in a way, it comes through here as well. Well, it makes you question what is a poem if you can have a poem that's about nothing. Very interesting. I mean, it's an existential question because he is only exploring with language. He doesn't need meaning. And frankly, that's the same thing with music. You can enjoy the greatest music. You don't need words. You don't need to get a message from the composer. That's what I want to say. You just enjoy the music. Or colors, paintings. Look at postmodern art. There is no concrete message, but rather there are images or floating shapes and forms. That is postmodern. We really could say some of the medieval poets are postmodern. That's the latest trend actually in research that we begin to realize oh. how much many of these medieval poets, particularly when they talk about love and the dialectics of love and the difficulties of expressing ineffable things. Remember I used that word a week ago, ineffable or apophatic. That's exactly where we are today in, in light of relativity theory. Sorry for making these wild jumps. But there are interesting connections. See, when he says, I don't know when I slept or wake if someone doesn't tell me. My heart is almost broken from the grief in it. And I swear by saying, Marshall, to me, the whole thing isn't worth a mouse. But he doesn't know. It is the basic human question. Who am I? As if he were, well, avant la lettre, or in Descartes with cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, means nothing anymore. It brings up so many philosophical questions. I leave it up to that. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we can say goodbye. It's our time is up. And I appreciate it. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, Stay tuned, I should say, right? Thank you very much. See you next week.